Morning. Dale uh, has extensive background as a producer, ruminant nutritionist with Alberta Agriculture Sheep Industry Consultant and columnist for Sheep Canada Magazine. So I will go ahead and turn uh, the microphone and the screen over to Dale and we will get started with the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, also, thank you to uh, West Central Forage Association. I'm using their offices here in uh, sunny downtown Entwistle, Alberta. Their, uh, uh, their uh, high-speed internet is truly high-speed, where mine at home a few miles down the road is not. So, so thank you for joining us. Uh, let's try to uh, get things going here. And I picked kind of a bit of a controversial title to this. So why bother with uh, testing? Um, There we go, why bother testing soil and feed? Uh, it takes some time and effort and money. And I think I've uh, convinced myself many years ago the value of this, and I guess my task today is to put some of that in those thoughts in your mind as well. So Dale, we can't see your screen yet. You just have to accept. Okay. You can't, eh? So I have to do what? You just have to accept. Uh, you should have a little screen up there that says, accept viewing our screen. Stopped. No one sees your screen. Uh, show screen. Yeah. Does that work? There we go. Yes, I've got it now. Thanks, Dale. Okay, good. So again, thanks to Alberta Lamb Producers for uh, giving us this opportunity to get together with this technology. That's, that's kind of great. Easy to do. Okay, so how do I advance my uh, screen here now? Should just no, be able to click it. Okay, it's not going forward for me. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Webinar focus, is that what you see, Robin? I do, yes. Good. So, outline of what we're going to talk about today is I want to talk about the value of chemical or what I call objective uh, feed and water evaluation. Uh, touch on what analysis I find most useful when I'm trying to put together a feeding program, how to take correct samples and, and uh, get them off to the lab and where labs are located, that type of thing, and give you some uh, chance to answer questions that you might have about this technology or this tool. A uh, study done uh, by a uh, project Alberta Agriculture and Alberta Land participated in a number of years now, but indicated that feed costs are usually in the neighborhood of 40% of your total cost. So, Anything we can do to uh, make good use of that 40% investment or to reduce that investment, I think, is, is worth talking about. So feed evaluation, there's, there's really two components, uh, the physical, sensory, or subjective evaluation that you or I can do with our noses and our, and our uh, um, uh, eyes, uh, where we evaluate the odor, the color, leaf content in particular, uh, steminess or coarseness. We can also detect mold, we can see undesirable weeds there. Uh, it takes a little time to get expert in this area, but that's all it takes. It, you, can, you, know, you can physically work it through your hands and, and make those kind of observations. But they are subjective, hard to put a number or a rating to them. Chemical analysis is, is much more objective, of course. We're coming up with a hard number for something like protein or phosphorus, uh, copper. And we've also got the benefit of having some published standards or some standards of what is acceptable, desirable uh, with respect to these nutrients. Uh, when it comes to trying to make an interpretation. Chemical analysis of feed or water is done through available accredited laboratories, uh, most commonly, although some feed companies now do have access to technology where they can do some of the analyses in feed mills. Now, we're really looking at nutrients, not just feed overall. Uh, so we're looking at very specific nutrients that we want to get uh, handle on with a chemical analysis. We can also look at contaminants or negative features of a feed uh, with, with feed evaluation, and uh, that's an important part too. Uh, right off the bat, I want to let you know that a sample probably costs you in the neighborhood of $50 to $100 to have analyzed. So, um, you know, for larger operations, that's not a concern, but for small and medium sized operations, we want to make sure that we uh, spend that appropriately and, uh, and don't do, do it more than we really need to. Water evaluation, again, we've got physical, sensory, uh, subjective uh, parameters to look at. Uh, obviously, the color of the water, the odor of the water, turbidity or suspended solids, uh, the presence of algae, if you're using a dugout or a pond, uh, could be a factor that you could evaluate uh, with your senses as well. 
But again, as with feed, we've got the opportunity through laboratories to do a chemical and a biological test uh, and again come up with uh, an objective, uh, a number that we can relate to or can interpret with. Uh, chemical analysis gives us uh, chemical elements and compounds, microbial contamination that tells us what microbials, microbes might be there, uh, E. coli, for example. And they also do a suspended solids test that tells us how much uh, other uh, solids are in the water and, and could have an effect on intake. So we always get the question, well, feed testing versus book values. Uh, any one of you can look up uh, on a software like Sheet Bites or in a published nutrition book, uh, average or what we call book values uh, for different feeds, wide variety of feeds. And I certainly use these at times and I use them to predict what is likely to occur when this feed is fed. But I'm not always happy with that. And I ask you if you're happy with a, a likely occurrence rather than a more guaranteed occurrence uh, when you feed that feed. Keep in mind that any biological system or a product of that system is, is, has inherent variability. Uh, this in the case of the feed supply is uh, due to soil nutrient supply. If it's in, deficient in the soil, it's likely to be deficient in your feeds. Uh, growing season weather conditions, uh, whether it's too dry or too wet, uh, both of those can affect the quality of the feed, the uptake of the nutrients. And of course, finally, harvest and storage conditions. You all know the, the fun of putting up hay uh, in, in a wet July and what effect that can have on the terms of the quality. And some of that you can certainly see with your senses, but you can confirm that with uh, chemical analysis as well. So this time I like to tell a story about this gal that's skeet shooting and she's got a double barreled shotgun there. And, and her first shot, she was high and her second shot, she was low. But she was very happy because on average, she hit that little orange disc. And uh, that tells us a little bit of the story about, uh, about why we should be feed testing. Water evaluation, uh, no average values to rely on. Uh, your neighbor tested his water supply when he got a new well last year, and that's probably a good place to start if you don't have anything else, but it's probably at a different depth, could be in a different aquifer and so on. So uh, really your own water supply is an important part of your overall feeding program that often gets uh, ignored. So why take the chance on having an adverse uh, outcome uh, based on poor water quality when it's pretty simple and easy to get the water tested? So I thought I'd put together a top five reasons for testing feed. And the first one that comes to a nutritionist's mind is also uh, is uh, relative to balancing rations. Um, we balance rations to meet production targets. Uh, body condition score on use is, in the, is a good indication of a target. Average data gain on feeder lambs, again, is a target that we want to try to hit. Um, but really beyond body condition score and use, we want to ensure strong, healthy lambs at birth, use that will milk, we can, with feed testing and ration balancing, we can go from 75% likely to occur, you know, we can be successful using our average analysis to what I think is a much higher level of confidence. I think I can get to a level of confidence where I can predict 95% confidence on what will occur when I've got uh, feed analysis results to work with as opposed to book values. Allocating feed resources. Uh, usually most farms use up all the feed that they've harvested in one way, shape or form. They get some value out of it by feeding it uh, over the winter period of time and maybe even a bit longer. But why not ensure the best feed is used for late gestation, early lactation and rapid growth of lambs? Use your best feed for when the requirements that you're faced with are the highest. Um, you can use mediocre or poor feed for maintenance, perhaps early gestation as I'll show in a minute. But uh, be sure you've identified and allocated your best quality feed to when the sheep need it the most. So Robin, we have a poll uh, available for the producers. We'd like to just uh, have a little bit of interaction here. And uh, my wording of this is which statement best reflects your beliefs? Uh, sheep eat the same things as beef cows and therefore can be fed and managed in a similar manner. Or sheep are special creatures and deserve your special care and management. So, Robin, you've got a, a way set up where they can vote on these two alternatives? Absolutely. I'm going to launch it now. So um, everybody should be able to see this uh, poll pop up on their screen, and you can select which, uh, which option you believe. We did have it. a word limitation there, so it's a little bit different worded than what my uh, more windy version is. <laughs> so go ahead and vote there, folks, and then I'll take a drink of water and we'll be back in a second.
Okay, I've got about 90% of people on the line have voted. I'm going to give it five more seconds. Do you want to give us the results? Yeah, hang on. It's just... Uh... Not letting me do that. <laughs> well, let me go forward there while you're doing that, if you can, and I'll give you a few hints. So, one thing I like to look at is relative output of offspring at birth, or birth weight as a percent of the weight of the dam giving birth. And in this case, I've used some measurements here called kilograms of birth weight per kilogram of body weight, but it works out to be the same thing as percent. So, a ewe that gives birth, a 180 pound ewe that gives birth to two lambs weighing nine pounds would give me 18 pounds of lamb per 180 pounds of ewe, which is 0.1, uh, which is 10%. So 0.1 kilogram of birth weight per kilogram of body weight or 10%. And you can see when I compare that to the other common farm species that she's well ahead of the game in terms of what we're asking her to do uh, during that gestation period. It surprised me when I looked at these numbers that even a sow giving uh, birth to 10 little piglets doesn't match the ewe in terms of percent of birth weight as a percent of her body weight. So this is a U with twins. Uh, if we had a U with uh, oh, giving birth. There we go, Dale. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I just shared the results there. Can you see them? Uh, tell me what they are. 100% for the second choice, B, sheep and cows, uh, as we manage differently. Good, good. We've got some, some dyed in the wool sheep producers here that know, <laughs> know what we're talking about. There we go. Sorry to interrupt here. I'll uh, put it back to you. Thank you. So, uh, are you giving birth to triplets, which is certainly not uncommon, especially with the more productive breeds, uh, could give us, uh, you know, three, pound, uh, three lambs at seven pounds, 21 pounds, and there would be up that graph well over 12% of body weight. So, what we're asking those ewes to do in late gestation is a big challenge, especially relative to other livestock species. With respect to milk production, well, the sow and the dairy cow beat the ewe in terms of milk, amount of milk produced as a, as a percent of her body weight. But look at the difference between the ewe and the beef cow. Again, on a unit of body weight, we're asking that ewe to do a lot more, be a lot more milk production out of her little body than we are with respect to the beef cow. And finally, when we look at growth rates, if we take a 30 kilogram, a 65 pound lamb, uh, quite commonly they'll gain 400 grams or easily three quarters of a pound a day. And that's well over 12% of the body weight of that lamb on that given day. Compare that to a 400 kilogram steer where we're asking them to gain it maybe 1.5 kilograms, uh, that's close to three and a third pounds a day for an 800 pound animal. Uh, look at the, what we're really asking that animal to do and put through their digestive system. So really, uh, the second choice that you've, uh, you've made there is the correct one. Uh, they're not mini beef cattle, which some people uh, make the mistake of the first year they get into sheep. In late gestation and early lactation in particular for the maternal breeds, and when we look at the growth potential of terminal breed crosses, uh, and we've got a number of good crosses available now that can really put some growth rate into lambs, but they don't live up to this genetic potential unless we get them the quality of nutrients to perform. And one of the objectives with uh, feed testing is to ensure that we get the quality of nutrients in front of these sheep so that they've got the genetic potential to, uh, or they can achieve their genetic potential. Number three. Uh, reasons for testing feed. I like to identify the best buys when purchasing feed. So know what you're getting when you purchase feed especially. Um, you know, if I'm going to purchase a $500 TV, I checked on the internet and it said nine things you should know before you purchase a TV. Nine things. So screen size, screen type, refresh rate, lag time. And the last time I bought a TV, I educated myself in that regard. But that was only a $500 investment or purchase. When you're going ahead and spending thousands of dollars on input feeds, whether they're supplements or extending your forage supply, uh, don't you want to know something about that feed? Uh, the big thing that I like to see is uh, that when I get feed test results, I can allow a comparison on a unit of protein or energy basis, feed A, feed B, feed C, and I get them right down to what's this costing me per unit of protein, which one of these is the best buy. So identifying the best buys when purchasing feeds is, is a, a big thing for, for my business. 
The fourth one I like to quote is fine tuning the cost of the feeding system. So for example, you're able to purchase really good quality hay, dairy quality alfalfa hay, or maybe you even harvested it yourself. And um, ewes would go through easily five pounds of that if given uh, the chance to eat that. Voluntary intake would be two and a half percent DMI, uh, dry matter intake, and that's two and a half percent, even more as a percent of their body weight. So they would easily eat five pounds, and if this is $100 a ton, that's gonna cost you 25 cents per ewe per day. But they really don't need the quality of nutrition that they're getting out of that feed especially in the, that early gestation period that I'm using in this example. They could do quite nicely in the first 100 days of gestation on two and a half pounds of that very high quality feed and a pound and a half of straw. And uh, we could reduce our cost per ewe per day by 10 cents. Uh, so this is a theoretical example for sure, uh, but these numbers do occur. Uh, for $2,000 saving for 200 ewes over the first 100 days of early gestation, it's worth your while to spend a, a $50 investment in a, in a feed test. Now, as a word of caution, I normally wouldn't uh, recommend feeding that much straw, even in early gestation, unless I know I've got really high quality feed. I can't take that risk. I have to work with the more likely outcome and, and use some uh, average values and, and wouldn't feed more than maybe even half a pound of straw. But I know in this case, this feed is high quality and I can limit it and cheapen up the ration considerably uh, with that use of that feed testing tool. Another example is phosphorus content, and phosphorus is one of the more expensive minerals for us to supplement in any, uh, any situation. Often, too often, I think we just feed it free choice and let the sheep eat whatever they like to, to eat of it, and uh, that, that can be costly. In the case of grown grass, for example, a 10-year average in Alberta showed that the mean or the average value of phosphorus was 0.16%, but SD is the standard deviation, 0.06. So a considerable amount of those feed samples tested were less than 0.1%. The average minus the standard deviation is a value of 0.1%. So a sample that is above average requires very little mineral supplementation, about two cents worth of mineral per ewe per day, whereas a sample that was one standard deviation below would cost us twice that amount. And again, this cost ends up to, for 200 ewes, for 150 days of gestation, ends up about $600. So maybe that's not significant for some of you, but if you've got very many sheep, it can certainly add up quickly. And you know, I like to think of look after the pennies and the dollars look after themselves. I'd much rather have that $600 in my product pocket than the pocket of the, uh, of the uh, feed company. And again, with feed testing, I know and can be certain that I'm still not shorting my use of phosphorus when I can uh, reduce the consumption to that level. I know I'll still get the productivity that I suspect, expect. Number five, the last reason is to avoid disasters or wrecks. Um, number of nutritional disorders exist, like I have on this list right here, that uh, are related to uh, poor quality nutrition, poor quality feed. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, something in the water or the feed that may not appear to be a poor quality feed visually, but it's, it's too high and can cause some problems. And the first one on the list is polio and cephalomalacia or lamb polio that you often see in, in uh, feeder lambs. This can be due to excessive amounts of sulfur in the feed or sulfates in the water. You know, and I've got one client that last year brought in a new well, found out the sulfates were, were, were quite high, 750, 800 parts per million. Uh, and we adjusted the feed mineral program there to avoid any lamb polio occurring in that situation. Um, so knowing what the sulfur level is in his feed, and it, that can be high, and also in the water, we were able to make those kinds of adjustments. Copper deficiency uh, due to low copper in the feeds is, is actually quite rare to see any visual signs of that in sheep. But more commonly, we see copper deficiency as a result of excessive molybdenum or excessive sulfur in the feed or the water. And again, with this particular client, we increased our copper supplementation significantly because we, we know there's a bit of a molybdenum problem in the feeds and certainly with this new well and the sulfur levels, we, we uh, certainly increased the copper level there. Sheep producers are probably more common and more frightened of copper toxicity than they are copper deficiency. And certainly that can occur uh, sometimes with feed mixing errors, uh, using cattle supplements for, for sheep and that type of thing. It can also occur when forages are grown on fields that uh, received hog manure in the last few years. Again, one client uh, converting in from hogs to, to sheep production. We, the first sample of forage we had took off that farm uh, when I first started working with them was 30 parts per million of copper and immediately my, 
my the hair on the back of my neck stood up and we made some adjustments there and, and watched carefully for copper toxicity. We could still utilize that forage. We didn't have to burn it or throw it away, but knowing we had it there allowed us to do some alternative uses for that feed and uh, avoided any issues there. Nitrate poisoning, cereal or annual forages uh, can be quite high in nitrates due to drought uh, or frost on uh, growing plants uh, and can result in nitrate poisoning, which symptom is usually just a dead sheep. Uh, although a veterinarian will give you a, a more confirmed diagnosis when you have some problems of that nature. But again, a nitrate test on, on uh, cereal forages is routine in my estimation and uh, it will certainly allow you to sleep better at night without, uh, without worrying about nitrate poisoning. Weak lambs at birth uh, can be caused by a number of things, but one of the things that can be caused by is low protein in the diet. And yet the ewe can still look fat and thrifty as yeah, she can have a high body condition score, have the fat reserves, but if the protein is low in the late uh, gestation period, you can have weak lambs at birth. Uh, trace mineral deficiencies again can cause uh, weak lambs at birth in the absence of any physical signs of, of the ewes being unhealthy or affected at all. Poor milk production, uh, a good ewe in good condition can lose a little bit of weight off her back, uh, feed uh, the energy requirement during lactation from the fat on her back, so to speak, but she can only do that if she's got adequate protein in the diet. And a low protein diet there, even if the ewe being in good condition, can still result in uh, poor milk production and poor growth rate on those lambs. So just a few things that we can avoid uh, by getting a feed test result. Okay, so there's a summary of the top five reasons I see for feed testing and that, uh, uh, that my clients have agreed to and uh, certainly uh, bought into the feed testing philosophy. I like to think of this, uh, as Sue Hosford used to say, as precision management, allowing us to be more precise with our feeding program versus living with likely what will ha happen. So precision management versus living with likely is uh, the result of having a feed testing done on, on a good portion of your feeds. So if I hopefully I've convinced you of the value of that, the next question is how often should I test feed and water? Well, the major feed supplies you have available to you, I think you should test each year. And by the major feeds, I mean those ones where you're going to be using them during the critical periods. You're really relying on the high quality feeds there for LG, late gestation, early lactation, or in the case of rapidly growing lambs. So you can focus on the, the, the feeds that you really need in that, uh, in that uh, two month to three month period uh, as a first place to start when you're selecting feeds for, for, uh, for feeding. Um, you know, if you've got a grass legume feed, it's put up in the month of July, it's not weathered too bad, it's certainly going to meet the needs of the ewes in, in a long dry or maintenance period. And so I'd be less concerned about uh, that medium quality feed and testing that and more concerned on spending my, my hard earned dollars on the feeds that I'm going to use in that critical period. Byproduct feeds, oh the other comment I would make there is I very rarely do I recommend feed testing straw for example. In my example, I have a pound and a half of straw per year per day. That's as high as you probably ever see a straw consumption diet, uh, unless under special circumstances and drought conditions and so on. But so most, most of the time you're going to be feeding a quarter pound, half a pound, hardly even a pound of straw. And when it makes up a small component of the diet like that, I'm not too worried about the analysis of it. And also because straw is fairly consistent and a lot less variable than, um, than uh, your annual or your uh, perennial forages. It's put up as a mature product, it's stable at that time and uh, of very low quality, but, but certainly not variable. Byproduct feeds uh, often can be economical sources of nutrients that are highly variable. And by byproduct feeds, I mean grain screenings, uh, oil seed screenings, pulse seed screenings. Even in some cases, I've got clients using the food industry waste, such as bread, potato chips, uh, that type of stuff, bakery waste. And uh, they can, can be a very economical source of nutrients, but are highly variable from load to load. So in this case, I would suggest when you first get a, a, a first few loads, uh, test three samples, um, a sample per load, if that's the way it's working out or being delivered, uh, to establish a baseline that you can work with, and then probably every three or six months thereafter. Or when you note a change, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you're buying screenings and there's uh, 30 tons to, to a semi load or uh, five tons to a truck load. And all of a sudden it drops down to three times per truckload. Well, something's happened to that particular product. So check your weights uh, on, a, on a byproduct purchase. And if they really vary off the normal, then there's something missing there that, and worthy of a test right away. 
uh, water. Um, I suggest water be done initially when you, if you haven't done it yet, uh, do it now, or if you get a new well, do it right away. And then if any changes to the supply occur, usually water supplies are fairly stable if they're from a well source, less stable if it's a runoff source. So use your judgment there and, um, and uh, make the call, but uh, initially get the water analysis in place. <clears throat> What tests are most useful and worth your dollars? Well, the basic minimum for forages is moisture protein, ADF or acid detergent fiber. And acid detergent fiber is uh, used to predict digestible energy content of the feed or total digestible nutrients, TDN content. And the basic minimum analyses usually come with calcium and phosphorus as well. Uh, moisture comes in every test basically, so you want to know uh, what's in the dry matter portion of the feed, and that's why moisture is there on, on basically every test. NDF is a term called neutral detergent fiber, and it's a useful predictor of dry matter intake. And that leads then to what we call RFV, or relative feed value. So knowing the nutrient content of the feed, plus an indication of how much the animals will eat of that feed, comes up with an RFV rating. And that can go anywhere from uh, 75 on a straw to 130 for a good quality dairy type alfalfa, maybe even a bit higher. So relative feed value kind of combines both of those uh, energy estimates and uh, the intake estimates to give you a number that, again, is a standard that you can relate to. Minerals like magnesium, potassium, and sulfur are often included in the mineral package. These are much more critical in cereal forages where we can get low calcium, low magnesium issues. Uh, but um, they can still be valuable in a, uh, in a perennial forage alfalfa type forage as well. Uh, in some cases, like potassium, it's because we've got way too much potassium in the forage and we want to know what that is because it, again, might impair the absorption of other nutrients. So uh, I've never seen an alfalfa sample that was deficient in potassium, but I've seen some that were way too high and, and we needed to adjust the ration for that reason. So those minerals are important. Uh, for forages, the trace minerals uh, are available, copper, manganese, zinc, selenium being examples of, of key trace minerals. Uh, to establish a baseline on your farm, I recommend copper, manganese, zinc. Uh, it'll come with iron as well uh, in the package. Uh, relatively cheap to add to your packages. And uh, I expect them to be low throughout most of Western Canada. But it's nice to know I'm really focusing in for, for sheet nutrition on the copper level there. The manganese and zinc are, are still important, but uh, not quite as critical as the copper level. I like to do copper, molybdenum, and sulfur if I'm looking at a situation where I want to make a significant amount of copper supplementation to the diet. So something beyond the basic minimum recommendation for copper. But I won't do that without knowing what the molybdenum and sulfur content is in the feed and what the sulfate content is in the, um, in the water because those three elements are so closely uh, related to each other and affect each other, we have to be careful with uh, getting carried away with copper supplementation unless we've got significant problems with molybdenum and sulfur in the diet. And again, feed testing is going to tell us that. There's no way we can look at, at a feed stuff and evaluate it for mineral content. Selenium, my, uh, my position on this might be a bit controversial, but seldom do I recommend a selenium test. Um, for several reasons. First of all, it's often deficient in our Western Canadian uh, feeds. It's an expensive test. It doesn't come with the other trace mineral packs, so you could spend $60 on that test. And finally, uh, because it's such an important uh, element, nutritionally speaking, um, I routinely recommend it be supplemented to the full extent of its requirement. So uh, meeting the requirement through the supplement, and then whatever it happens to be in the feed, uh, over and above that, is um, not of concern. It's a surplus to the requirement, uh, but it's not going to harm you in most situations. Now, the one situation, the one situation where I would be concerned is if you live in a known area where there are some selenium accumulating plants, or you know that you've got high selenium in your feeds, um, or the neighbors do, or the the, count, or the uh, extension agent has told you this, the feed company do it, does it then of course you don't want to routinely supplement and get into some problems with an overage. But uh, selenium del uh, has des attracted a lot of attention from the feed regulators, kind of the feed inspection agency. But the difference between the requirement for selenium and the toxic amount is well over a tenfold difference. So the requirement is about 0.2 to 0.3 parts per million 
we don't really get concerned about the uh, you know cattle and sheep can tolerate levels of two and three parts per million and maybe even higher. Whereas copper, we've only got about a threefold difference between requirement and uh, toxicity. So for sheep producers, much more concern than, than even selenium. pH on silages determines the quality of fermentation and even the bunk life after it's fed. So that's a routine kind of a test and not very expensive. And again, nitrates on annual cereal forages, in my opinion, should be routine and avoid sleepless nights wondering what's going on there. For grains, uh, grains are generally less variable than forages. Again, you think about a grain, we've got a mature product at the end of, the, of its cycle there, so its, it's variability is uh, much less than um, uh, forages. Um, nonetheless, moisture and protein testing, especially if the grains are taking a high portion of your diet, i.e. A, a lamb feeder ration, I want to know the protein. If I've got a 14% protein in my barley uh, versus a, a 10 or 11, uh, then I can certainly not waste money on protein supplement. So knowing that is going to be an economic consideration as well as a performance consideration. Volume or bushel weight is uh, often what's used for energy prediction in grains. Um, again, a simple test to do, not very expensive. Minerals, I you know, don't do a lot of mineral testing in the, uh, in the grains unless it's part of a basic package. But uh, we supplement the growing rations with, uh, with uh, minerals anyway and especially calcium, sometimes sulfur as well. So I'm um, not real concerned about minerals and grains, but uh, like to see it once in a while. Uh, and again, the testing is more valuable than the high energy lamb rations, you know, given that the lamb ration would be 70, 80, 90% grain versus a U ration where we're only 10, 15, or maybe 20% grain. So again, focus your dollars on uh, where it's gonna have the biggest impact on your bottom line. Ergot and mycotoxins are a problem in some years. Uh, last year in Alberta, 2016, uh, both were of a concern uh, and other prairie provinces as well due to the wet harvesting conditions. So ergot and myco mycotoxin testing is sometimes uh, uh, recommended, uh, again, depending on your growing season uh, during the year. Um, they are not cheap, especially mycotoxins. Uh, molds and mycotoxins can be expensive. But again, if you want to avoid a wreck, um, avoid uh, problems with moldy feeds and certainly with ergot, uh, it's money well spent. Byproducts, as I mentioned, are grain, pulses, oil seeds, screenings, food wastes. Uh, here we usually get a basic moisture protein test as well, uh, similar to grains. Energy though can come from uh, starch, fat, or digestible fiber, depending on the which byproduct we're talking about. So an oil seed screening, for example, a canola seed screening, you'd certainly want to get a fat test or an oil test, same thing, in that product to know what the oil content is. Not only because it's a major contributor to, um, to the energy in, the, in that feed, but also we can overfeed fat and shut down the rumen uh, microbes uh, fairly easily if we feed too much fat or oil in the diet. So there's, again, a reason for, for that. But again, look at your screening product, know what know what it's supposed to be there, and then decide what uh, tests you want. And I recommend consulting a nutritionist, your feed company, perhaps a veterinarian, to get a useful energy analysis out of, uh, out of our byproduct feed. Uh, on the grain side of it, again, the screening side of it, ergot and mycotoxins can be a problem in some years. There are some specific diagnostic tests that most labs do make available. Mold species uh, identification and the count on the molds. If you've got a particularly moldy product, you're concerned that you have to feed it uh, or think you have to feed it, especially to pregnant animals and young animals, that, that's probably worth your investment there. Uh, mold species produce mycotoxins, so you can take it one step further and find out, well, sometimes molds grow but don't produce mycotoxins and sometimes they do. So it's a more precise evaluation relative to mold and mycotoxins to get the mycotoxin levels. And there's half a dozen different uh, mycotoxins. Um, specific mycotoxins. Uh, generally speaking, ruminants can uh, handle moldy feeds better than uh, monogastrics like poultry and hogs, but there are still limits and sometimes we do reach the limits uh, there that uh, allow us then to, to uh, blend out that feed, use it in a different fashion, use it at a different time of year, that type of thing. Medications and drug residues can be uh, uh, obtained at some of the labs. Again, that's very specific. You would be using that in a diagnostic sense probably with your veterinarian as opposed to uh, uh, a nutritional sense. Specific microbes, listeria can be a problem in silages and uh, so if you have a problem with listeriosis and you're trying to find the source of it, 
you'd first look at your silage product and uh, if you want to uh, test for mysteria, they can do that in, in feed stuffs. Irrigate bodies and alkaloids, again, specific tests. These are expensive tests, not routinely needed or recommended, but if you're trying to diagnose a problem with your veterinarian, then I'm sure that they would probably start to look at some of these tests uh, to be useful in pinning things down. So uh, if you uh, send the sample off to a lab and put, fill out their forms, they're probably going to ask you whether you want wet chemistry done versus near infrared spectrometry done. So wet chemistry is actually the test tube chemistry. The, you know, the feed is put into a test tube. It's digested with some type of an acid, and there's uh, different ways of detecting then the, uh, the uh, nutrient elements uh, as a result of that process. So wet chemistry has been around for 60, 70, 80 years. It's the gold standard uh, in most uh, situations. And uh, it's a bit more expensive and more laborious than NIRS. NIRS is sometimes called black box technology. It, it uses light absorption at a specific frequency, infrared frequency, to analyze the organic bonds in feeds. Um, it's been around for a while too. Uh, Alberta Agriculture did a lot of testing with NIR in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, a lot of groundbreaking work that the labs now use, and that can be reliable. Uh, NIR has proven to be reliable for organic constituents in common feeds, so things like moisture, protein, and the fiber components, ADF, NDF, that we talked about, but does require specific calibration equations to exist, so there has been a lot of research to, to, uh, to feed back to the lab and that the lab uses to, in order to use NIR to predict the ADF, NDF, and energy, and other parameters. So there are, it's uh, looking at the digestibility of organic compounds. Um, so it can look at digestible fiber, digestible amino acids, again, where the animal research testing has been done to calibrate the uh, scan or the printout from the uh, NIR machine. So there's two things. It requires considerable computing power uh, at the lab to uh, make the, uh, uh, to go into the uh, calibration equations, and it requires the data from wet chemistry or animal data to calibrate. So as I mentioned before, it's useful for organic constituents, organic bonds in the feeds. So therefore, it's not really effective for the mineral elements. And you'll often see the labs do a NIR package, but the mineral elements are done with wet chemistry. And they'll state that right on their, on their uh, options that they're providing to you. So NIR is faster, it's cheaper, um, but it does have some limitations when it comes to being of value as a feed test. Water analysis, most labs uh, have a standard livestock water package for all the important mineral compounds. Um, you may want to add microbial analysis if you're concerned about the potability of the source. So if it's coming from a dugout and you think there might be some uh, contamination there, uh, you may want to do a microbial analysis as well. In addition to, to accredited labs, your health units often will be able to analyze it for human use. And uh, the results uh, from that test are you know, good for you to, to, and your family, but it's okay to use those results too in most cases for, uh, for your livestock interpretation. Reports from the water analysis usually come with some interpretation guidelines or specific warnings if you exceed some of the standards. So as a nutritionist, I'm interested in things like sodium, sulfates, any toxic minerals uh, that might be in the, in the water that would affect the feeding program. Sulfates, again, is one of the bigger ones or more common ones that we are concerned about. So sampling is a key to an analysis of any, uh, of any type. Uh, you've got to get the sample right or not bother doing it at all. Uh, success depends on analysis of a representative sample. You know, you've got 100 bales out there that you've got off that field. Uh, you can't just sample one or two bales and think you've got a good representative sample of what you've got to work with. Uh, same thing with water. You know, you have to run the tap and there's some procedures that are well, uh, well documented in terms of tap sampling water as well to get a good representative sample that will be worth your investment and valuable for you to use. For forage testing for bales, only test core samples of bales. Only test core samples of baled forages. And no point in taking a grab sample and stuffing it in a bread bag and sending it off to the lab. A hand sample or a baled forage will not get you the, the correct leaf to stem ratio. So use a core sampler and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Silage and grains, however, we can do a core sample. We can go across the face of a, of a silo and pick out 
handfuls, small handfuls of, of silage, or we can grab all around the grain pile. We can use a grain probe to go into a bin and get, again, a representative sample. So just use some common sense here to make sure that what you're putting in that bag, that pound of material you're sending off to the lab and spending 50 or 80 bucks on, is truly representative of what you're going to be feeding your animals. Here's our core sampling tool, and uh, you know, it goes right into the bag. The bag's got labels on it. A minimum of 10 to 20, 20 samples of forage, so 10 to 20 bales to give you a good representative sample. Of course, the bigger the field, the more bales, the more cores that you want to take off to be representative. Uh, we are fortunate we've got a company called Star Quality Samplers here in Alberta. It was started by an Alberta Agriculture's uh, retired lab director. When he retired, he could see the frustrations that we nutritionists had with existing core sampling tools and, and built a better mousetrap, so to speak. And they now have available a variety of soil forage and grain sampling tools. It's been bought out by a company in Iracana and is available uh, to, to anybody. But uh, here's just a couple of examples of the type of forage probes they have. The one on the left is a push and pull kind of thing. It takes a little bit of grunt work to get that into a bale and, and back out. Uh, but it can be uh, a simple way of getting a sample. The one on the right is the more deluxe one that's powered by a hand drill. It's a multi-sampler. And the key to making it work and taking the work out of uh, sampling is that uh, spiral assist uh, tip. It really sucks that uh, probe right into the bale. And if you haven't used a spiral assist tip and you're frustrated with the work it takes to get a lot of forage sampling done, uh, try one of these particular products and, and it'll take the work out for you. I don't mind uh, promoting an Alberta company because I don't think there's anybody else in Western Canada that actually makes uh, star, uh, samples of any type. And uh, here's their detailed information uh, if you want to get a hold of them. Uh, websites, what most people use, starqualitysamplers.com, and, and you can see what they've got there. And uh, no, I don't get a, uh, a commission on any of those things. I'm not involved with the company other than I really like their products. What does feed testing cost? Well, forage is anywhere from 25 for a very basic NIR analysis, all the way up to $100, uh, but usually at 50 to $75 will give you and your nutritionist enough work enough information to work on and do a good job. Uh, grains a little cheaper, 25 to $75, uh, a little higher, again, if you're going to go into uh, toxin testing and that type of thing. Byproducts, the same thing, 25 to $75, depending on the lab and what analysis you really want to go with. Uh, water samples, when I did a recently checked wide variety of uh, pricing on water samples, uh, 38 to $92 is, is what I found, and um, yet this, the, the uh, $38 sample provided everything that I was looking for as a nutritionist. So, again, keep in mind that these prices do not include the toxin testing or the special tests that uh, would certainly go a fair bit higher than that. Accredited feed testing labs, a list of them are available either on the Alberta Land Producers uh, website, uh, just by, uh, or the Alberta Agriculture website. And other provincial governments, I'm sure, have uh, listed on their websites as well. But, uh, uh, accredited feed testing labs available in every province, um, and you can you can shop around, check out their prices. It's uh, you know if you're putting it into a, a bag in the mail or the courier system, it doesn't take much longer to go to a lab uh, far away as opposed to a lab that's close. So look uh, for some good competitive pricing on your feed testing uh, options there. But uh, accredited labs uh, are certainly the way to go in that regard. So to wrap up, uh, there's a companion article on this topic that I wrote through the Alberta Land Producers Newsletter. And uh, that will be coming out, uh, Robin, I guess in a, in a few weeks or so, something like that. Or you can request the, the article directly from me. My contact information is uh, following here and uh, um, I wouldn't mind sending that out to you by email. Uh, internet searches, uh, internet's a valuable tool. Uh, there's other people's opinions that you can solicit uh, uh, when you uh, search the internet, there's lots of articles written about feed testing and what tests to, to uh, find and use, that type of thing. And ALP, as, uh, as Robin mentioned, uh, starting off has some good resources relative to nutrition. Uh, the one that's probably the best is the Alberta Sheep and Goat Management in Alberta, the nutrition module, uh, available online or in hard copy. And there's about uh, uh, eight or nine pages devoted specifically to this topic uh, on feed testing. And again, available at uh, www.abertalam.ca. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Robin, for this opportunity. And thank you to those of you who hung in there to uh, 
to uh, take this all in. Uh, Robin, I'd be happy to uh, spend a bit of time answering any questions that people might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dale, for uh, that presentation. So, um, everyone on the line, this is your opportunity to type in a question here and have Dale answer it for you. I don't have any questions yet, so I'll just give people on the line a couple seconds here to uh, type in your questions and then uh, we'll get them answered. I hope you enjoy a picture of my wonder dog there. Uh, I call her wonder dog because uh, she's a highly active uh, puppy and at my age, I'm not sure why I picked out a border collie puppy to to accompany me because she's she's more work than the, than the average dog, but she's a, a wonderful dog, but not without her uh, warts too. <laughs> they keep you young though. <laughs> well, Dale. Yes. I'm not seeing any questions here, so this is just okay. final call. Uh, five more seconds here, um, and you can see everyone on the line can see Dale has uh, graciously provided his. Uh, uh, email there, so if you do have questions afterwards. Oh, I've got two just came in here. <laughs> okay, so I've got uh, one question, Dale. What are symptoms of nitrate poisoning? Okay, well, as I mentioned, the symptoms of nitrate poisoning are often dead sheep, because uh, they die fairly quickly from it if they consume enough of it. So you might come out in the morning and just see some dead sheep. Um, but uh, what happens is they suffocate. Uh, uh, instead of having hemoglobin racing through their veins and providing oxygen to their tissues, uh, the nitrates uh, cause a production of what they call met hemoglobin that does not carry oxygen to the tissues. And so um, if you get there soon enough and early enough and uh, cut them open, uh, your, the blood would be quite a chocolate color as opposed to a, a nice red color. Uh, other than that, uh, talk with your veterinarian. They may have some other things that they can do uh, that can give you an idea that uh, nitrate testing was, was the pro or nitrates were the problem. But uh, Unfortunately, it's, it's very common to see just to some dead livestock. You would also see in some cases uh, some abortions too. So if it's marginal for nitrates, uh, it'll kill the fetus before it'll kill the adult. And you might see an abortion storm uh, that, that occurs. And of course, anytime you have an abortion storm, you've got to talk to your vet right away and uh, make sure, pin down what the cause of that is, because there's a number of reasons for abortions. Okay, great. Um, another question here. Uh, okay, so it's a specific question here. Cover crop of oats tested protein 8.2. Is there a need to add more? Not sure if there's enough detail there. Uh, to add more analysis, I think is what the question is. And uh, yeah, so 8.2 as a percent protein tells me something in terms of protein nutrition, but it doesn't tell me anything about the digestibility of that forage or how much that forage would uh, would be consumed. So. That's where the fiber testing comes into it. An ADF and an NDF test really then tells me uh, an energy value and a consumption prediction for that forage. Um, so I would, I would get a more, more detailed, uh, again, if that particular forage is something that you're going to be using during those critical periods, uh, late gestation, early, uh, early lactation. Uh, typically a green feed is maybe not real useful because it's low in protein, uh, and that one's well below average for sure. Um, so maybe it's something you're going to use in the dry period and, and you can get away with an 8% protein during a long uh, dry period or maintenance period. But if you're going to try to use that for making milk and growing lambs in, in the shoe or after the, they're born, I would certainly want more information because we're going to have to supplement it with something. Okay, super. Um, when to sample the rows of silage and the risk of probing the silage row? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you can actually uh, sample silage when you're putting the silage into the pit. So my, my, one of my clients uh, likes to get a head start on what's in that particular product. So there's no reason as you're filling the pit, you can't sample that pit over the two or three or four days that it takes to fill it. So what I recommend is that uh, each load that comes in, the person on the packer takes a handful, puts it into a, a, a five gallon pail puts the lid on it to keep uh, that moisture content. At the end of the day, mix all those samples together. You might have 20, 30, 40, 50 samples in that pail. Mix them all together, take a subsample, put it in the freezer bag and put it in the freezer. So that's day one. Day two, day three, day four, you again, keep that going with that same process. 
Then at the end of the process, you take all those samples you've got in the freezer now, five, six, or seven ones a day, mix them all together again thoroughly, and uh, take a subsample of that, and that's the one you send off to the lab. Now, you won't get a pH test there because it's pre-fermentation, but all the nutrients are going to be there that are going to be there when the silage comes out uh, two or three or four months later. So that'll allow you and your nutritionist to start to plan right away how to supplement that forage. Then after the soil the pit is opened up and you fit out of it for a couple of weeks, take a second representative sample and confirm what, you, what your first sample told you and then that will give you your uh, fermentation profile as well if you've got a good pH in it and so on. There are companies that make silage pit uh, probes um, and you can you know, drill them in through the top of the silage or the side of a bale, that type of thing. And uh, you can get uh, a sample that way too you know, post-fermentation and prior to feeding, but again, you've got to clear it, you know, tape up that hole to make sure you're not letting oxygen in that bag or that surface uh, carefully, or you'll cause some mold issues all the way through there. So there are some silage probes, and as um, Star Quality Samplers does make one, it's a bit more work trying to get that probe into a, a compacted the mass of silage, but it can be done if you haven't done the uh, sampling during the packing and filling stage. Thanks, Dale. I think I've got one more here for you. Um, does pea straw need nitrate tests? Um, good question. Because it's straw and it's mature, you would normally say uh, probably not. Uh, other straws, cereal straws, I would, I would say no. So again, it's not likely that there's a, um, a, a nitrate problem in, in pea straw or any other straws. But again, because of the cheapness of it, and uh, I would certainly um, invest the money. If I'm sending that, if I'm going to the work of sample and sending that sample off to the lab, I'm going to spend another $15 on a nitrate test on a cereal product or an annual forage. Uh, you can often get some green materials, some second stage growth in there that could be high in nitrates. So, uh, so again, to sleep well at night, I would certainly invest in the, in the test. Okay, super. Well, thanks, Dale. That is all the questions here. Um, so uh, it's about five to noon. So we will uh, end the webinar. But uh, first, I just want to thank Dale for uh, his time today and his time three weeks ago in, uh, in doing another webinar for us. I uh, really appreciate your time and expertise in joining us all um, on the line here on Saturday morning and uh, in keeping this webinar recorded on our YouTube channel for uh, future uh, views. So thanks so much, Dale. Um, really enjoyed having you today, and uh, thanks to everybody on the line. So have a you're great welcome, and You're welcome. I enjoyed it, and uh, again, happy to receive any emails with, with questions or comments. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dale. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye now.